Costis, thank you so much. And uh, Vicky, thanks for being with us this morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Costi said, my name is Jason Bordoff. I am the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School and the director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia SEPA. And in this opening session, we're going to explore with one of the leaders in the uh, oil and gas sector, corporate strategies to transition to net zero. And I'm really delighted to have Vicki Holub with us once again here at Columbia University to talk uh, about this. Our time with her is short, so I won't read her whole bio. She is the president and chief executive officer of Occidental Petroleum. Uh, you can find uh, her bio on, on our website and, and online. I will just note that for all the Columbia alumni watching this morning, I hope they love their institution as much as she does her University of Alabama and Crimson Tide football, which we talked about, I think, the last time she was with us at Columbia. Vicki, thanks for being with us. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. It's great to be here. I think you um, last joined us in person in New York just about exactly two years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been an eventful two years for you, the acquisition of Anadarko just before a global pandemic that sent oil prices crashing. Uh, before we get into the specific topic of the day, I just wanted to ask you to reflect a bit on, on the last two years, how you coped with those challenges, uh, where the company is now and, and where your focus for the path forward. Well, my, um... The, the thing I've learned over the last couple of years is never make a big acquisition before a pandemic. But if you do, make sure you have an incredible staff that can work their way through this. And, and so I'd say over the last couple of years, what's been a huge learning and benefit of the last couple of years is to see what our organization can do. And I think if you have an empowered and engaged organization and you give them the ability uh, and facilitate allowing them to do the things they, that they want and need to do, then you can make it through a pandemic. And not only our company, but we've seen companies around the world step up the employees and, and do all that's necessary to help corporations survive through this. And the resilience, the strength of, um, of people all around the world has been amazing through this pandemic. There's a lot, uh... Uh, I'd love to ask you about that. We'll, ha we'll have you back to talk further at some point, but I want to focus on the topic of the, of the panel today and the topic of this conference, which is how we think about the transition to net zero. Uh, you have um, committed the company to be uh, net zero by 2040, I believe, Can, and, and you've said the future of Occidental is being a carbon management company. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? What does it mean to be a carbon management company? Yeah, um, the thing about it is to address climate change, there are many companies, oil and gas companies that are going to building uh, renewables and, and things like that and, and going down different paths. And we all have a path that we need to establish for our corporations that not only help to mitigate climate change, but also deliver value to our shareholders. So that's our challenge. And fortunately for us, we have 40 years of experience with CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. And so our, our uh, ability and expertise around CO2 management is perfectly positions us along with the infrastructure we have in the Permian Basin to develop a strategy that enables us to fill what I believe is a big gap right now and uh, that needs to have, that we need to have happen to be able to cap global warming at one and a half degrees, and that is carbon capture. To me, the, the progress with electric vehicles, the progress with wind and solar, all of that's working well, and, and we need that to happen. Uh, but there is a gap, and the gap is carbon capture, use, and sequestration. And that's the gap we believe we can fill. We, as I said, not only have the experience and expertise, we have the infrastructure in the Permian Basin that enables us to do it in a big way and, um, and right there where we are because the Permian Basin has the capacity to store 150 gigatons of CO2. So what I see in our future is not just continuing to be an, only an oil and gas company, but to be a company that facilitates not only our capture use and uh, sequestration of CO2, but for others and for especially to partner with maritime and aviation companies that are much more difficult to decarbonize to help them become a part of our strategy too, as United Airlines recently has done, to, to enable them to get to a point where uh, they can also become net zero by 2050, which is their goal. 
And can you, um, there's, uh, I think, a fair amount of excitement about leadership being shown uh, in the industry on transitioning to net zero with a vision like that. You know, there's some skepticism too. I just want to ask you to address it, both on the economic side and on the environmental side. So uh, people who say, you know, how are the economics of that ever going to work? Um, What do you say to that? Carbon capture and certainly direct air capture is still pretty expensive. Well, the, the, the reason that we're perfectly positioned to do it too, the other reason is that we have a chemicals business. And when you look at direct air capture today, it's not done in a, in a, at a large scale anywhere around the world. There are three different technologies that are being used. And, and I wish success to the other two technologies because we need all three of these technologies to work. But right now we don't have it at scale. So I think if my numbers are still current, the, the largest sequestration or largest direct air capture that's being accomplished in the world today is about 4,000 tons a year. The facility that we wanna build in the Permian Basin will capture 1 million tons per year of CO2. And um, what's gonna help with the economics are two things, well, three things actually. One is 45Q, which has been passed to enable, give us some credits, uh, tax credits for the use and sequestration of the CO2. And secondly, uh, we're going to use it in an enhanced oil recovery uh, reservoir process. And I want to talk a little bit more about that later. Then the third thing is that uh, our chemicals business is a large producer of uh, PVC, which is going to be a big part of the construction of that uh, direct air capture facility. And we're the largest marketer of, um, of, potash, of uh, sodium hydroxide and um, yeah, cal- uh, sodium hydroxide. So producing that enables us to use that in the facility. And so that reduces the cost for us, makes it more synergistic with a business that we already have. So the combination of all three of those things will make the, the construction of the first couple of direct air captures economical. And what our goal is, and based on the model that we have, we believe that after we build the first couple, we'll, we'll start getting up on the learning curve and up on the efficiencies, and we'll eventually make that economical to build throughout the rest of the United States and internationally. So we we have a lot of confidence that we can make that economical. And uh, the second thing is around whether or not it's uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, the atmospheric CO2 is more than doubled since pre-industrial times. So it's not enough to retrofit industrial facilities. We absolutely have to have direct air capture. So in my view, this is not a scenario that where we have an option, we cannot fail at doing this and at doing this at a large scale. Well, that sort of comes to the other question I was gonna ask you in terms of uh, skepticism that, that I hear, I'm sure you, you do too, particularly in the environmental movement um, who think uh, w- what needs to happen is for companies that historically have produced oil and gas to do something else, uh, deploy renewables or clean energy technology. Um, but that a strategy like this allows you to continue producing oil while some technology will come along in the future to deal with the CO2. What do you say to that sort of skepticism about this, this plan? Well, the, the reality is the world is gonna need oil for decades to come. And I know some would like to stop oil today, but for aviation, for maritime, they need fuels. And so also we need uh, hydrocarbons to produce the products that make this kind of meeting possible that enable us to have phones and to drive cars and to watch TVs. So the products that are made from hydrocarbons cannot go away because that's what enhances our quality of life today. So, so the demand is going to be there and demand for, for oil will be there for decades to come. We believe the best way to meet that demand is with a net zero carbon of oil. And the way to get to that is to inject more CO2 to produce the oil than what the oil will emit when used. And that's our strategy. So there will be CO2 sequestered in the oil reservoir. That CO2 will, some of it will generate more oil production, but it's going to be a net zero or net negative process because ultimately, that's, we will have the process uh, in place to be able to make that happen. And, and that's the one thing that I think if the world could understand that piece of it, then we could advance what we're doing a lot faster. And again, you, you got to understand that 
the reason direct air capture and carbon capture uh, has not been done in a big way is because of the economics. So without the aid of incremental production from the sequestration, this will never happen. If it never happens, we never meet the goal because there's not an expert anywhere in the climate world that believes that we can cap global warming at one and a half degrees without carbon capture. So it has to happen. And this will help make it happen in an eco economical way. And it will help aviation and maritime uh, decarbonize and helps us advance the technology so that we can use it ultimately for straight sequestration. And, and you, um, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, uh, recently delivered what, what, it, what it called the world's first shipment of carbon neutral oil to uh, India's Reliance Industries. That, I believe, was not uh, direct air capture uh, with enhanced oil recovery the way you're describing, um, but involved offsets. Can you talk about the different strategies to achieve what, what you're talking about, which is how one might conceive of a barrel of oil where the carbon emitted when that is, is used is, is otherwise um, addressed through, through offsets or, or through um, air capture or in some other way. What are the different strategies to do that? Yeah, the, way, the reason we did that, um, that shipment of oil is we wanted to, um, to buy the offsets, prove that it can be done and that, that we can make it happen. And also to help start establishing a way to track it because what we need to be able to do is track our carbon, carbon molecules all the way from the reservoir to their end use. Without doing that, we really can't measure that we're achieving what we need to achieve, and that is net, net zero carbon uh, oil. And um, with the net zero carbon oil, that's what's going to, to fuel the avi aviation and maritime industries, and that's what's going to help us build uh, new products in a way that's, that's zero carbon. And how do you view, I mean, you, you talk about a strategy which evolves to this technology, which many of our colleagues at Columbia are working on, uh, of carbon removal from, from the air, uh, direct air capture. Um, others are relying more on that offset strategy. Can you just comment on how you view that and whether there's a lot of good work, I think, that can be done in forestry and in, in land-based uh, carbon removal, but there are limits to it, too. I don't think we can continue to use 100 million barrels a day and just offset our way to net zero. What, what do you think of the role offsets can or should play for the future uh, of, of, of the energy sector? I think offsets have to be there for, again, for industries that can't otherwise get there. And uh, the technology companies, they can't get there without offsets. So there has to be an industry of offsets. And unfortunately, we can't get there with the natural means either. Uh, forestry and all of that is important to do and it needs to be done, but it can't solve the problem for us either. The reality is people have to understand that it's gonna take renewables, it's gonna take natural sinks, it's gonna take carbon capture, and it's gonna take us all becoming more efficient in the way that we use energy. But the carbon offsets have to happen and that's why a company like ours and the oil industry in general can help with this problem without engaging the oil industry and letting the oil industry be a part of the solution, the world will not get there because we are the experts at being able to manage the CO2 that comes from our products, at least Oxy is. And there are other companies that are starting to delve into this too. And we've got to be the company and the industry ultimately that provides the offset opportunities. We've got to, I believe, the, the only way to get there rapidly is through direct air capture because it's really, really hard to get industrial sites to want to spend the money to put the carbon capture on their facilities. You know, you walk up to a, a refiner or um, it went, fortunately we had White Energy who, with their, who committed uh, to capture the CO2 from their ethanol plants, but it's really hard to get people to spend the money to capture the carbon in the environment that we're in today, because that's a cost to them, a cost, and it impacts their shareholders. For us, uh, the, the scenario we're in today is that through what we're doing and through our strategy, it's a benefit also to our shareholders. So this is sustainable. It's not sustainable if it becomes just a cost and no benefit. So that's why we believe that we can make a difference in the world. And that's why we believe that the more we can accelerate what we're doing and show people what the model is and how it works, 
the better chance we have of making a difference faster in the world because of, with the tra trajectory that we're on today, we absolutely, the world cannot get to where we need to be by 2050. And can you just say uh, another word about the enabling policy, the policy support that's gonna be needed to, to make this economically viable? You talked about the 45Q tax credit for those not familiar with it, a federal tax credit, a federal subsidy for uh, carbon capture, for carbon removal. Um, you, you've said recently that you don't support, I believe, a carbon tax, which is another way that um, many uh, economists and others sort of say this would be what you want to do to level the playing field by making companies and people pay for the harm caused by by emitting CO2 and, and then low carbon alternatives uh, can compete more favorably. Why, why do you have that view of that policy mechanism? Because a carbon tax kicks the can down the road. It doesn't support the development of technology today. And that's what has to happen. With a carbon tax, the stronger companies will just buy the offsets. And, the, and there, there will be then a lot of competition for the offsets that exist today. So that means direct air capture technology really doesn't get developed until you run out of all the other offset options. And so uh, people have to understand that we can continue to build renewables to replace electrical power generation, but we can't do, uh, we can't build the things that'll replace the other needs for hydrocarbons. So there will, would be a point at which there are no offsets left to buy and we'll still be on a trajectory to end up with uh, continuing global warming through 2050 and beyond. So we've got to get to the point where we are capturing CO2 from the air and a carbon tax will not make it happen at the pace it has to happen. It ha needs to happen today. And that's why we're in our feed study right now for the direct air capture facility we'll build in the Permian. We're going to start with one. We're gonna build ultimately 18 and that needs to happen. And when, that, when we can make the technology commercial, then it'll be developed around the world. But without this and uh, without the incentives to develop the technology like 45Q rather than a tax that just enables people to prolong the decisions that we need to make today around carbon capture, it doesn't work. Just in, in a last minute or two, and on the policy environment, um, can you talk beyond uh, the full scope of what one might think about with um, uh, being a carbon management company uh, for the industry as a whole, and different companies have different strategies, there is a lot of focus as well, uh, as I think there should be, on dealing with scope one and two emissions, uh, dealing with methane and flaring. Congress recently reinstated the Obama regulations on methane emissions, and you supported that. Can you talk about why that is? I think we need to get a lot better at, um, at our methane management because it is more potent uh, pollutant. And so we need to do all that we can around that. That's also gonna require development of further technology and, um, and designing our equipment differently so that you reduce the emission, the potential emission points. And by reducing the potential emission points, you can better manage um, your, your methane uh, leakage and, and certainly we have to eliminate flaring. And we were the first US oil and gas company that committed to the World Bank initiative of eliminating all routine flaring by 2030. We believe it must happen and uh, must happen today. We're trying to do it today. Um, and during the, um, during the recent storm, we did shut down um, our oil production when, when we couldn't, didn't, couldn't get our gas to market uh, during the storm. So it's, um, it's again, a technology play and changing our paradigm about how we work and live in the oil and gas industry. Finally, do you think this consolidation and discipline in the shale patch will, will hold or is this all short lived? Are we gonna see a, a rush of shale production coming back with higher prices and what's your sort of market outlook? Are we seeing another underinvestment cycle that shaped up it, for higher prices? It looks like the, uh, the larger oil and gas companies, us um, and some of the other uh, companies that are our, our size are, are larger are uh, maintaining the discipline. I believe consolidation must happen. There are too many companies out there. There's a lot of synergies in consolidation. We found it with the Anadarko acquisition, more than, uh, more than $2 billion in synergies. Uh, so they, I think some consolidation will happen. And I think that the discipline has to be there, but I think that there, there are going to be some companies that, that don't recognize that, unfortunately.